Hello and welcome to the Friday, December 7th, 2018 edition of the Science and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Earlier this week, Adobe released an update for Flash fixing a vulnerability that was already exploited in the wild. Now, I told you you may have a week or so to patch this before the exploit is more widely available. Well, I was off by a couple days, sorry for that. Uh, proof of concept exploit has been released to GitHub, so better get on with patching. And then we also had Apple updates yesterday and one of the notable omissions was an update for watchOS. Well, uh, this was released today, so a day late, probably because it also included some major new features and Apple probably wanted to sort of have them stand out a little bit. The vulnerabilities being addressed here are all vulnerabilities that were also addressed in the other operating system updates. So a uh, number of elevation of privilege vulnerabilities here in the kernel also again WebKit vulnerabilities. No issues so far with this update so get it done, get it patched. Uh, nothing really sort of overly urgent uh, with uh, this particular update however. And then in diaries today, we got the one by Rob about how to exfiltrate data in penetration tests. Of course, a penetration tester will take a little bit of different route off than a normal attacker would because typically the goal of a penetration test is not necessarily to exfiltrate as much data as possible, but more to illustrate the severity of a particular vulnerability and also to illustrate how various controls would have helped or or, well, may have helped if they are in place. So for example, there are a number of ways that Rob goes over how to obfuscate or encrypt data before exfiltrating it, or not to do so if you're actually trying to figure out if some basic data leakage protection system, for example, is in place in order to alert someone of the data exfiltration. In general, for a real attacker, it's usually not all that difficult difficult to sufficiently obfuscate the data in order to bypass the, the leakage protection systems, in particular the simple ones that just look for certain patterns. You may still get caught just based on the data volume if your DLP is actually sensitive to that. Little word of caution here for pen testers. Uh, like I said, it's usually not really the goal of a pen test to exfiltrate as much data as possible. If you end up doing so, then of course, be a respectful and cautious custodian of that data that you exfiltrated. The last thing you want to have happen is that you are actually now leaking the data and are the source of a breach as a pen tester. And I think it was about a week ago that I was uh, mentioning a uh, privilege escalation vulnerability in Kubernetes, the uh, container management system. Well, there is a proof of concept available now that uh, will dump the secrets from the default etcd Kubernetes container. So yes, uh, please patch this. Yes, it's only a privilege escalation vulnerability, but if you do give users limited access uh, to Kubernetes, and if you're worried about some of those credentials uh, that may get leaked, uh, then you're certainly at risk. Okay, it's Friday again, and uh, with me today I have uh, Preston, uh, an STI student who just uh, finished a paper about two-factor authentication. Uh, Preston, why don't you introduce yourself? My name is Preston Ackerman. I'm a graduate student pursuing the MSISE degree at SANS. And I'm also a law enforcement officer investigating cybercrime. Your paper was about two-factor authentication. It's always a big topic these days. Can you just summarize quickly sort of what the research was about and what you found? Sure. When we spoke before, I had completed my first paper, which was on awareness video messages for two-factor authentication. And that project explored the important aspects of developing an awareness message. And another thing I'd like to point out is that a lot of my research and my projects while I've pursued my degree has focused on small businesses and home end users because I see the 
battle in cybercrime is not particularly a fair fight for these folks and, and something that I think is important to us as security researchers and advocates to really try to get the best information in the hands of those users. But so my first paper highlighted that our messages need to clearly identify personal risks and present users with a strategy that they believe will work and is within their capabilities. And the other part that we kind of found in my first one was that when users lack self-efficacy, which is their confidence in their ability to carry out the action, they usually will not even attempt it. So during that project, I identified a couple questions I wanted to answer uh, in my most recent work that we're talking about today. And so those questions were, does offering a real-time demonstration of 2FA implementation increase adoption? And then also, does marketing the easy-to-use push-based 2FA, um, and, and we were using Gmail accounts, so it was Google Prompt, uh, rather than only SMS-based 2FA, result in increased adoption? And so to, to answer those questions, I partnered with a private university to set up a study, and the study was focused on millennials. The participants were divided uh, into a control group and an intervention group, with the control group viewing a message which advocated use of 2FA and provided them links to resources, but it did not offer a real-time setup demo. The intervention group, on the other hand, they viewed a similar video, but which added a message which conveyed that 2FA is effective against the threat, but it added the steps of demonstrating the real-time demo and Google Prompt. So with that, each group uh, answered questions after viewing the video regarding their intent to use 2FA and a variety of questions regarding their use, their views on the severity of the threat and the ease with which that they feel that they can implement 2FA. And then a week after they viewed the video, all the participants were brought back and surveyed again and they then provided objective data on whether they had added 2FA to any of their accounts or not. And they were again questioned on sort of some behavioral constructs regarding their future intent, response efficacy, and costs. And so once we were able to do that, the data showed that the real-time demo did not have a statistically significant impact on getting users to adopt 2FA within the one-week time frame. Initially, I was a little bit disappointed in this result, but I realized that, you know, we, we have to accept that whether or not whether or not it's what we hope, there's still value in knowing the answer to these kinds of questions. But as I explored the data further, there were some positive aspects I realized about it after all. Um, the first of those was that there was a statistically significant improvement in the future intent of the, the users who viewed the real-time demo versus those who didn't. So um, by seeing how easy it is to set up and use, it made them more open to using it in the future. So you think it just wasn't enough time one week for them to actually follow through with their intent? or uh, That's possible. Um, I, generally speaking, I think, I, you know, I think if it had been two weeks, I doubt if more of them would have gone again to do so. Um, you know, people usually kind of, if they're going to do something, they get it done pretty quickly. But I think this sets them up to where if they're kind of reminded of it again in the future or if they're setting up a new account and it offers it, they'll dive right in and do it. And the other issue I was thinking about uh, when we were just talking about this, that uh, the age group you looked at, uh, I would expect them to be already somewhat aware of the risks. So do you think that video sh you showed them didn't really have any new message as far as the risk was concerned? Oh, I think st still people are a lot of times surprisingly naive to the threat. Um, you know, in the, the circles you run in and I run in, yeah, everybody's yeah. extremely aware of these things. But to the average person out there, I think they're, they're somewhat aware, but they haven't necessarily thought about it a whole lot or certainly researched the solutions to it a whole lot. Yeah, and I, I think that's true. You know, as information security professionals, we often forget the average user and their struggles kind of in making stuff work and uh, making systems work. Now, uh, along those lines, sort of, you know, you mentioned Google Prompt and one tendency 
lately has been really to just uh, no longer use passwords and basically instead of two-factor authentication, stick with one factor, but make that one factor some kind of token or an app. Um, you know, Web auth N is of course sort of one authentication standard that's sort of emerging there to support this. Uh, do you think that the usability is really sort of a big uh, problem uh, that users will not do two-factor authentication just because it's too complex and something like passwordless authentication would solve most of the information security problem while make it actually easier for the user? I think that would definitely help. Uh, one thing that the, that I did measure in the study was with those um, who did view the real-time demo, I measured their self-efficacy, which is their confidence after seeing the video in their ability to, uh, to use a second factor. And to that end, there was also a, st a, a statistically significant difference with the ones who saw the, uh, you know, absolute real-time, you know, no sleight of hand, setup and use of the second factor, they were indeed more confident in their ability to use it than the others. But I think to your point of, of going with it as only a single factor, I think there's, uh, it, it, part of it is usability, but in some ways I think the usability is already there. It's a little bit just more acceptance and, and user confidence maybe in those kinds of, of mechanisms. And that's another interesting thing. You mentioned the generation that I use uh, there, there are some good research studies out there by Pew Research Center and uh, IBM Security showing sort of the differences between millennials and the other generations. And the millennials tend to be a little bit more lax with their password hygiene, but more open to biometric authentication measures and uh, second factors in general. So it's really more the privacy convenience trade-off is there a little bit different, I guess, you know, than uh, it has been traditionally. One of the real game changers I always thought with two-factor authentication was Google Authenticator, uh, just because it not only made it a lot cheaper to implement two-factor authentication, but I found the usability part because uh, now, of course, now many sites use that same two-factor authentication. You don't have to relearn how to use two-factor authentication with every site that uses a different token, a different app, or whatever. Do you think uh, that makes a difference uh, to have sort of you know, one application, one procedure, how to set up two-factor authentication? Does this make adoption rates easier? I see. That's the thing. I do think that was my hope. It was that showing users how to use prompt in the in the video would increase adoption, and actually, it did not. So it it didn't actually boost adoption, and in fact, it really even failed to, in a statistically significant way, shift more of the users to prompt, which was you know actually a, a little bit of a disappointing. Um, outcome as well, because I kind of hoped it would. My experience with that technology is exactly like you just described. I, I think it's easier, and we haven't even discussed, and I think you know all of your uh, listeners probably know that prompt is better from a security standpoint, of course, than, than SMS as well. But despite that, it seems that people are a little bit reluctant to use it. And so what that really kind of tells me, what I concluded in the study, was that familiarity with the technology used as that second factor is extremely important to users. So, I mean, I think we could all agree that out of the second factors, basically SMS, text, uh, SMS, text, email, and phone calls are familiar to most everybody. And those three accounted for 81% of the user's preference as a second factor. But hardware and software tokens and authenticator app and, and prompt only accounted for 19% across the whole study. Now, you know, thinking about, uh, you mentioned earlier, if someone does it, they do it right away or they don't do it at all, kind of you know, with the one time, one big time frame. 
Uh, do you think what's really important is when you sign up for a new account that you're immediately being offered to set up a second factor, that it's not something you sort of have to dig for? Uh, I find in many websites, you know, even probably like Google and such that heavily advocate second factor, uh, they don't really push you toward a second factor. Uh, it's of an option that you have to find yourself almost. Uh, do you think that would be a real next level game changer here where uh, whenever you sign up for an account, after you enter your password, it tells you, hey, by the way, uh, do you want to set up a second factor? Yes. I would like to see the providers push it much more than they do. I mean, I, I think some of them at least give it a, a decent amount of lip service. Um, and so they, they kind of appear and maybe do really encourage users to do it. But to your point, I would rather see it, you know, you hear stuff about choice architecture and sort of opt-in, opt-out. I would rather it be almost more of a, you have to go to some trouble to opt out of it. I think that would be nice. But in any case, this this type of study helps um, produce better awareness messages for it. And so, you know, they, some of them do have a video message on their landing page as to why, um, why 2FA should be used. Now, leaving a little bit of the scope of your paper, the, as a developer, uh, the one thing I'm really struggling with with two-factor authentication is how do you actually reset a lost two-factor authentication token? Um, any ideas here, anything that you came across that uh, you thought worked well in that respect? No, and, and I, I didn't put a lot of effort into that portion of it because it wasn't really what I was looking at, but th that is a downside. I mean, that, that does need to be, you know, represented to users. Uh, I, I did change, you know, phones recently, and it wasn't terrible to get it, you know, get everything set up again, but it does require... Uh, a little bit of thought and, and typically you want to do it ahead of time if you can while you still have both factors. Well, that doesn't happen, right? If it's a lost or destroyed device. So it can be a little, uh, it can be a little bit of a hassle in that respect. Yeah, I saw some of the applications, like also, you know, went through the you know, change phone exercise. And that's always a big hassle, I find, uh, if you have like a dozen different uh, two-factor authentication setup. The best solutions of I have seen for the end user is you know, there are some two-factor authentication applications that allow you to back up the second factor. Of course, then you trust whoever maintains those backups. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, yes, uh, resetting you know, password has always been difficult. Uh, resetting second factor, I think we still have to really figure out sort of how that works and uh, what sort of an acceptable method of doing that. Right. Anything you're working on next? Any plans for the future? I think you're almost done with your career. <laughs> yes. Well, I I don't know exactly what's next, but one of the things that kind of came out of the paper has me has me thinking about some some next steps, um, or maybe these are just a a good idea for somebody else that's going to be doing some research. Uh, but to to get to that, I kind of have to convey one final point from the paper, which was I on the last part regarding user preference of the second form of 2FA, I noticed, it, well, I mentioned that, you know, the video didn't really tend to shift m many users to Google Prompt. So I wondered, well, what factors did influence the user's decisions? And one of the data points that I had was instructive. And that's that experience with 2FA had a statistically significant impact on user preference, particularly with respect to SMS and email. So what I found was that the users who reported prior 2FA experience, they didn't care much for, for prompt, but were heavy, heavy SMS users. And users who didn't have prior 2FA experience, they still didn't like prompt all that much, but they were kind of equally divided between SMS and email. So that kind of brought about something that I think is a fairly important point that I hadn't necessarily set out to address specifically. And that's this idea that one size fits all security awareness training is probably not optimal. I mean, we, we have to start somewhere. So the uniform training that most places have is certainly better than nothing. But as awareness programs evolve, I believe more research needs to be done 
to develop a tailored approach to awareness training, not just for 2FA, but in general. And so this study showed in particular that experience has a major impact on user choices and how the messages resonated with the users for 2FA. But in addition to experience, we need to find out what other factors impact that. Things such as generational and cultural differences or affinity for technology and so forth. And so with that, I think a, a, pra a practical application would be for CETA training to have content available to address all of these important differentiating factors, sort of some different messages, way to, ways to present it. And then the training could then begin with some questions to assess the user and then provide a tailored selection of the material for maximum effectiveness. And in this way, uh, businesses could get more impact out of the training time, that precious time of their employees. So that's something that I would, uh, and it's not, I'm not saying that's an original thought. You know, there's, there's some stuff out there about uh, one size fits all with the CETA training. But I think it's one that is kind of in its early stages as, as those programs evolve. And so I might be interested into uh, looking into more uh, nuanced points related to that. That sounds cool, interesting, and I certainly always like these adaptive uh, training programs that don't tell you a bunch of stuff that you already knew, but then you know miss on things that you actually didn't know yet. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks uh, for being here. So uh, it was great to talk to you, and uh, good luck uh, moving forward. That's it uh, for today. So thanks everybody for listening. Uh, link to Preston's paper will be in the show notes. So thanks, and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.